Hello everyone, welcome back to another One More Chapter Book Club. I hope you're all well and continuing to stay safe and that your weeks are going really well so far. I am so excited for our book club today and have been looking forward to it all week. As today is our first ever One More Chapter Book Club where we shall be discussing not one, but two books from two brilliant psychological thriller authors. Our first author, author, Jackie Kabler, has joined us before a couple of weeks ago for a book club um, when her fantastic latest thriller, The Perfect Couple, had just come out. From then, it's gone from strength to strength, reaching number nine in the Amazon chart ranking and still going strong in the top 10 of the Kindle charts. And so we thought it would make for an extra special One More Chapter book club if she could join us again, but this time with prolific psychological thriller author and Sunday Times bestseller, C.L. Taylor. So thank you so much to Kelly for joining us at One More Chapter. And as I'm sure you already know, C.R. Taylor is an award-winning Sunday Times bestselling author of seven psychological thrillers. And her previous book, Sleep, was a Rich and Judy book club pick for 2019. Today, we'll be discussing with her her latest book, Strangers, which is also already a Sunday Times bestseller and is also storming the Amazon charts this week at number five. So as I think you can already tell, today is going to be a seriously awesome discussion between two best-selling psychological thriller writers, our queens of crime. Um, so please do comment away and ask them both lots and lots of questions throughout our discussion and tag any friends or family that you think would also love to get involved. But now enough from me and let's get started. So please help me in welcoming Callie and Jackie. First of all, I'm going to start off the the questions and I'll bring it up on the screen so we can all see it because um, I think that's always fun. Um, so my question to you both is strangers or the perfect couple, quite different concepts overall. Um, what were both of your inspirations for the books? So I'll, I'll, I'll send it over to Jackie on my right first and then we'll move over to <laughs> Mine was just one of those really random things. I was sitting in the garden one day and um, uh, just tossing book ideas around in my head, you know, and I had a few ideas and, I, and my husband was at work and I thought, gosh, imagine if I, if my husband just came home from work and I was simply gone. I was just not there. And then I turned it around in my head and I thought, hang on, what if I came home from work and he, he wasn't there? And then I started to find out all sorts of weird stuff about him and, and it just kind of developed from there. So it was one of those very simple ideas that just turned into a book. And nothing more complicated than that, really, for me. And I decided to set it in Bristol just because Bristol was somewhere that I knew because basically I'm quite lazy and I can't be bothered to research, <laughs> research new places. And also I hate to get new places wrong if I've never actually been there and I don't know them very well. So um, so that's it was as simple as that, really. Nothing, no, yeah. no great inspiration. Well, no, but like that's interesting, you know, that's and that's that's the sort of in, you know, in like inside the home, like um, that's that was sort of the inspiration there. But Callie, obviously, strangers. So that's a was the sort of the idea of strangers, your inspiration for the book or how did that all how did all that all work out? Yeah, um, mine sort of came together in a more sort of gradual kind of way. Um, I knew that I wanted to write about lonely people. That was the first thing I thought, I'm going to write a crime novel about lonely people who don't know each other because it just kind of sort of struck me as a sort of interesting concept that lonely people are in their own little worlds. But what happened, you know, what would happen if a crime brought them all together? So I kind of sort of tossed around a few different sort of scenarios where I could have lonely people and then have them brought together. Um, and then while well, I was walking through my local shopping centre after I'd done the school run one day and noticed how many people were shopping alone. And there's quite a few lonely people who I do think go there just to say hello to people every day. So I thought, OK, I'm going to set it in a shopping centre. And then I as obviously I saw like security guards walking up and down on their own, shop assistants behind a counter on their own. So I was like, okay, I'm going to have a security guard as one character, um, a shop manager as another character. And then I thought, wouldn't it be fun to have a kleptomaniac, a, a, sh a shoplifter, <laughs> a third character? And then, and then I just started to think about the, the crime that could bring them all together and uh and that crime would happen in the shopping mall yeah, yeah. such a cool, that's a cool fascinating um 
start off um, of a concert. I guess that's the thing for both of you as um, psychological thriller writers then, is that that sort of initial spark of that, is that always happens for all your books? Is it that just what, something that just starts it off and then it, you just explore where that goes? Yeah, I think I remember one of my very early books that I wrote. Um, I used to drive again, Bristol. <laughs> Bristol features a lot, but I used to drive quite a lot under the Brist um, under the Clifton Suspension Bridge when I was going to the airport to pick relatives up and stuff. And I remember thinking, because it is very sadly, or certainly was, a notorious um, suicide spot. And I remember thinking, gosh, imagine if I was driving along here now and saw someone jumping off that bridge how horrendous that would be mm -hmm. and that actually became the, the the start of one of my very first books and and it was one of those was it suicide or was it actually murder sort of things but yeah it's just those random things that strike you I don't know if normal people's brains work like this <laughs> we sort of <laughs> see, see doom and gloom and murder on, on every street corner but I yeah I guess you're the same Callie you just your your brain sort of works in that weird way where you think oh what if something horrible happened here in this nice place yeah yeah what if is is a really good jumping off point i think mm. if there's anybody watching who wants to write a short story or wants to write a novel if you start with a what if mm. it's it's you know it is the great jumping off point for for the idea to evolve mm. with other of my books um i've had a, a i've had different inspiration um so my early books i would often start off with a fear you know, um, what if a psycho ex-boyfriend came back into my life? I had I had one boyfriend who was really controlling and awful. And um, and I thought, well, what if he came back into my life now and tried to ruin it? So that was the um, jumping off point for the accident. And then with the lie, it was um, friendships turned bad. You know, I'd, I'd had an experience of a friendship in my life. I was um, part of a group of four female friends and I fell out with one of them and she tried to turn the other ones against me. So I used that as the, oh. the inspiration for the lie. But other books I've used news stories. So mm -hmm. for the fear, it was um, the teacher who took his pupil away to France. I started to think, what if she in the future sees that man grooming another teenager what would she do and so that was that was the jumping off point for the fear so it's yeah it's just something jumps into your mind and then what if it yeah. all leads from there That's so just go it was with similar it. for me with um, my last book, my first book with Harper Collins, Am I Guilty? That was inspired by a true crime podcast. I listened to a lot of true crime podcasts, from uh, mostly mm -hmm. from America. I was listening to one and um, it was about a crime. And I suddenly thought, that crime doesn't really happen in the UK. And I did some research and discovered that there'd never actually been a prosecuted case in the UK. There had been mm -hmm. cases, but never a prosecuted case. So I thought, well, aha, that's a good, that's a good uh, sort of opening line for a novel, a crime that has never really been prosecuted in the UK. So yeah, you can kind of get inspiration from anything really. And I think if you read quite widely as well, and news stories are, are an amazing way to get ideas, aren't they? They really are, you can get all sorts of inspiration yeah no, amazing amazing to just like to hear that sort of insight into both of your both of your minds about how you jump um from there you know to like then create you know, um, amazing stories so which kind of leads me to another question that i have then um which is more to do with how you actually approach writing these um these books do you then so you have your initial idea and you have the what if, what if this happened, do you then both plot thoroughly or do you just kind of see where the writing takes you? Jackie, do you want to go first? Um, okay, yeah, I'm, um, I'm a big plotter. Um, I'm very, I'm very worryingly organised in my life generally. So, I, you know, I, I always say that I'm, I'm the same in my books as I am in my life. All my bookshelves are alphabetically ordered by author and my mm. wardrobe is ordered left to right, darks to light. So it's very sad. I oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. But so, so it would be very weird, therefore, if I was very erratic in my writing. I'm not I'm incredibly organised and um, I plan. I always have I always have an outline written first and then I plan. I plan about four or five chapters ahead and then I write those and I plan the next four or five chapters. So it's not super super strict but it's pretty strict right, and quite organized okay. and I always know how it's going to begin how it's going to end and what the twist will be in the middle so I'm I'm pretty much yeah I'm very organized really what about you Kelly yeah. I'm not organized in the slightest in my <laughs> life um uh, everything is higgledy piggledy um uh Marie Kondo would cry if she came <laughs> in my house 
She'd love um, my house. <laughs> yeah, I I'd love her to be things. I'd love to be really minimalist and really tidy, but I just I just seem to accrue clutter. Anyway, with my books, um, <laughs> I, I am a little more organised. Um, I've actually tried loads and loads of different techniques for writing books. So um, I've tried pantsing it, um, which is writing by the seat of your pants, making it up as you go along. I did that with The Lie. Um, but I had I had awful edits for that. I had to rewrite so much that I was like, I'm never going to pants a book again. Um, <laughs> I've, I've also done outlines. I read that James Patterson does outlines for his books and that helps him write faster or, you know, the people he gets to write his books <laughs> helps them to write faster. <laughs> um, but I found... I found that took a lot of the magic out of, of the writing for me because I felt like I'd already written the book once by writing the outline. So I ditched that technique. Um, and what I do now is I use the um, four act structure, which has eight sequence climaxes. And I've got a massive whiteboard just down here in my office. And before I start, I get lots of um, uh, index cards and I plot out at least the eight sequence climaxes so the really exciting moments in the book the the, the bits where the uh, reader will really be going oh, you know I, I know those they can change but they those bits tend to stay um a lot of the scenes I don't know I just have to work out as I go how to get, get between the the different sequence climaxes but that's as I get to know the characters and then the twists a lot of my recent books have had a very final twist I don't know those until I get right to the end of the book and I just have to trust that it'll come to me, which is terrifying. But I think because I don't know what's going to be the final twist, it's a surprise to the reader as well. But it often means I then have to go back and seed in the sort of things that lead up to that twist. So, yeah, it's, it's a mixture of organised and, and sort of making it up as I go along. Yeah, wow, really interesting. Because you're, I guess, in some ways, you're both. That is quite a lot of planning, but like in very different ways, I guess. Because you know, Jackie, you're saying you're planning, you know, chapter, you know, what exactly kind of what's going to happen, but your chapters ahead versus, you know, Kelly with your like, you know, I can just imagine this amazing whiteboard with all these you know, <laughs> going to happen, and then kind of figure out how you're going to get there. Really, really cool to hear about those like two quite distinct approaches. Um, got some. So I'm going to pause on my questions for a sec to see what everyone else is saying here in the comments. Um, so I'm going to move back up. So please ask us more questions, everyone. Um, our first question here is from Kim, which is, how do you carve out time to write during lockdown? Has it helped or hindered your creativity? It's a good question. For me, it's really hindered it. Mm. Um, I had a retreat booked um this week and normally the thing that I love about retreats and the thing that I love when my family goes to school and work <laughs> is that I have peace and quiet in the house because a huge part of writing is thinking and when there's so much sort of noise in your head of other people and also the noise in your head of what's going on um it's quite hard to concentrate I found um, and I am writing much slower than normal because I will homeschool in the morning, then I'll walk the dog, then I'll have some lunch and then I'll finally sit down. And then but then I feel like a pressure. I must think mm -hmm. out these next few, few scenes and write them before before dinner time, because then there's the bedtime routine afterwards. So, yeah, I'm I'm finding it much trickier than normal. Interesting. How about you, Jackie? I don't have a child or a dog, so I have no excuse whatsoever. But um, <laughs> the, the first few weeks, I did find it really difficult. I th and I know a lot of writers felt the same. I don't know what it is. I think it's something about the anxiety of the whole situation does sort mm. of stifle your creativity. And I just couldn't really write the first few weeks. The last couple of weeks, I've sort of calmed down a bit. I'm, I've been writing quite a lot, actually, over the last 10 days or so, but it took a while. So yeah. I think it's been difficult. Lockdown's been such a weird time, obviously, for everyone. And I think 
it's been hard to be creative when you've when you're worried about your family and your friends and you're trying to you know I've been trying to because well, I've been working through it as well because um mm-hmm. obviously I work for a tv company and we're still broadcasting so yeah. even in itself that was quite anxiety inducing having to get to work and be at work and you know trying to not touch anything and all of that stuff so so it was yeah. hard to be creative but yeah I've, I've kind of I'm, I'm getting there now so so it's all good yeah no it's just a weird time for everyone isn't it and hard to yeah. you know to just to kind of get used to it but I think it's it's just good that we can all come together and chat and I feel like that's the good thing everyone's being so supportive of each other as well which is really nice um but yeah how is everyone read viewers out there how are you all doing are you struggling to find creative time or um has it been okay for you um let us know uh, so I've got a couple, some more questions here, which I will bring up on the screen. Um, which is um, this is a question um, that Catherine has noticed, Callie, on your Instagram that you've been posting a daily word count. Do you find this motivational or a bit of a poison chalice after your life? Yeah, I, I decided. <clears throat> I decided to come up with this. Um, writing in lockdown thing i'm just seeing if, oh here we go so i decided to come up with this um instagram writing in lockdown where every day i'd i'd post something like this with my face oh, behind it <laughs> um, and for the first week it was really motivating and i managed to write ten thousand words in a week which was brilliant wow. but then the next week um i had to write a synopsis for my agent which basically meant that I didn't write any new words of my book in in two days. So then I kind of felt a bit like, oh, God, you know, I'm going to have to post that my word count's not as good this week. And also, in order to take those photos with that sign, I had to do my hair and makeup every day. (laughs) And I was just like, I haven't really got got the time. So what I'm doing now is I'm posting like a random photo that I take in my day, and then I'll put the word count in as well. Um, it does make me feel a bit awkward if if I don't have a very good word count to post. But it, what it is, is it's ended up that I'm sort of sharing my process now. So I'll mm-hmm. say, um, oh, I only wrote a thousand words yesterday because I realised um, that an earlier scene needed to be fixed because it was ruining some of the tension in the book. So I had to go back and fix it. So what hopefully it's doing now is giving um, people who follow me on Instagram an insight into my writing process. It's almost become a bit like a, a writing diary. So I'm just I'm just using it as that now, really. And um, I've got to get the book written regardless of whether or not I post my word count to Instagram or not. So I'll just keep going. That's true. That's cool. Yeah, I guess that's kind of yeah. Do I the I guess that sort of idea of keeping a a sort of track of how your progress is going that could be quite useful for for writing have have you done that at all Jackie as well or no it's kind of <laughs> there you go. I haven't I'm I'm my deadline isn't till well I actually haven't I don't know my next deadline I think it's um not to the end of the year so I'm telling myself I've got loads and loads of time but actually you know how time runs away with you I'll probably get to September and then panic because I've done nothing um, <laughs> no I'm I'm sort of not putting pressure on myself at the moment I probably should actually I'll take a leap yeah. by the desk as well, which is my daily word wow. count wow. and my total. Wow. Which just, it just wow. keeps me accountable. But my my um deadline is June, oh. so I haven't so, got much time left. <laughs> Soon <was> then, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll keep you'll keep it up. Well, then that's good to keep track of it all. Um, Oh, well, I've got another question here that I'm going to bring up on the screen and then we'll go back to some more questions from everyone else, uh, which I find so interestingly, both of your books are set in Bristol, uh, which is cool. Um, is there something about Bristol that makes it a particularly good city for a psychological thriller, would you say? Um, and in general, um, how important is setting to both to all of your books? Um, uh, who would I mean, like I, to, uh, as I said earlier I, I sort of said it in Bristol because I'm lazy and you know I've most of my books have been set in places <laughs> I know quite well so West London Gloucestershire Bristol all my books are sort of set in those places um, it, partly because I because I'm lazy and I, I quite like writing about places that I know well because I can go to the down the streets in my head and know what they look like and everything mm. and also because I do find it I've read books where it's been set in a particular place and I know they've got details really wrong and that really kind of annoys me 
And so I don't yeah. really want to write books set in places that I, I did partly set one book in New York, but I have been to New York quite a few times for work and stuff in the past. So I sort of know New York a bit, but generally, honestly, it's a practical thing for me. And I do think Bristol does have some, mine is set on um, large parts of it that the murders um, happen on Clifton Downs, which I think is kind mm. of a quite a good place for a murder to happen. I don't know if murders have ever yeah. been, they probably have, I don't know. But it's sort of quite atmospheric and it sort of it seemed like the right place to kill somebody. Which makes me sound really <laughs> weird. <sorry. laughs> but it's I don't I yeah I've I've also used to, as I said to you both I used to live in Bristol so I yeah I do I can imagine uh you know there's there's quite a lot of like bushes and high you know hiding holes in the downs you don't really want to walk over there at night yeah um I that for certain um how how about you Kelly because you've got a lot of your books are, are set in Bristol aren't they as well is is that yeah I've set um out of the seven uh strangers is the third one that I've set in Bristol um mm -hmm. uh, I've set some in Brighton as well because I've lived in Brighton and some in London because I've lived in London it's like Jackie says if yeah. you know a place really well, all you have to, to do to sort of describe that place is to access your memories. You, you know how it feels to walk around those streets. You know what sounds you hear. You know what the people are like. It's much easier to build up the, the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, I did set Sleep, my last book, on the Isle of Rum, which is an island off the coast of Scotland. Um, and I didn't have time to go and visit Rum. So... I had to do a lot of um, spend a lot of time watching YouTube uh, clips of people who were visiting Rum. I watched documentaries. Um, a friend of mine was the ranger there, so I got to ask her a lot of questions. And it's not my ideal way of working. I would much rather visit a place to absorb the atmosphere and and my first impressions. So, for example, last year um, after Christmas, I went to Gozo with a friend because the book that I'm writing now is partly set in Gozo and I wrote my first impressions as as the um, taxi took us from Gozo airport to to the ferry um, from Malta airport to to get to the ferry terminal and I wrote down all my first impressions in my phone and I've directly transported them into my character's head because you can't get first impressions unless you've experienced it yourself so if I can, I will visit a place before I write about it. But it, you know, with childcare and the dog and everything else, it's it's not always possible. Yeah. So if people think that I described rum very well for for sleep, then that's um that's a real compliment. Not been there. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's really interesting. Um, cool. I'll bring up a few more um questions that I have here for you both. Um from Catherine. Hi, Jackie and Kelly. I'd like to know what you're most looking forward to doing when lockdown is over. It's a good question, a bit different. <laughs> I was talking to one of my friends about this the other day. It's really funny, actually. And because, um, you know, a lot of people are missing restaurants and bars and shopping and all that sort of stuff. And I said to my friend, what are you missing the most? And she said, you know, I'm missing going to the dump. And I was like, <laughs> and she said, she's been doing it for a house. And she's, she's going to the recycling centre all the time. And I said, you know what? I miss going to the garden centre. And we're like, we are so rock and roll. The dump and the garden centre. And that's it. Um, so, but I'm kind of missing, I think I'm, apart from the garden centre, which we can do apparently very soon. Yeah. This week, um, I might wait until next week until the bush goes down. But I think I just miss people. I'm quite a huggy person. Mm -hmm. And I just miss hugging people. And I miss... We can't do that after lockdown, but whenever we can do that again, that's going to be amazing because I just miss yeah. contact with people and hugging my friends and seeing people, really. that It's people, I think. I think you start to realise how little you actually need to make you happy when you're in this sort of situation, don't mm -hmm. you? And, and people, really. And the dump in the garden centre. <laughs> the <most laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're your top three. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. What yeah. Funny. I am... Um... So I'm really looking forward to having the house to myself. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing my parents um, and taking my son to see his grandparents. And for myself, the thing that I really want to do is I want to go to a spa and get a massage and a facial and read a book in the sort of ante room and swim. I, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm fantasizing about doing that. It just that would be lovely. That sounds, yeah, 
that sounds great. What about, <laughs> what about you, um, viewers out there? What is there anything that you're particularly looking forward to doing after lockdown? I think I'd. What am I looking for? I think. I think I also just miss, yeah, miss people, and it would just also. Well, I'm I'm in London right now, so I think I'm I'm dreaming about you know being able to like maybe just go out to the go out to the countryside at some point <laughs> and safely. Yeah. That'd be nice. <laughs> um, so we've got another question here uh, from Amanda Williams. Um, do you what well, kind of do you ever think about writing something out of your comfort zone? Um, is there anything planned i guess maybe she means like different genres or have you ever explored those those other things both of you the one thing that i have always wanted to write but have no idea how i would approach it is a tragic sweeping love story mm. like when i was in my 20s i loved the english patient the end of the end of the affair anything um was that is it the horse whisperer uh, was it was the other one at uh, Bridges over Madison County? Mm. Anything where two people were madly in love and then something terrible happens where they can't be together. I used to cry buckets in my twenties. Yeah. I used to watch those films over and over again, and I've always thought I'd love to write something like that. But I have not got the first clue how I would go about writing something like that. So maybe one day an idea will come to me and and I'll get to write it. But um, I get the feeling it would probably have to be slightly historical to work. And um, that means a lot of research. So at the at the moment, it's just a, a vague thought. <laughs> How about you, Jackie? Um, I suppose I suppose really I am still slightly out of my comfort zone because um, The Perfect mm. Couple is my fifth book. But my first three were a, a series of cosy crime murder mysteries. So mm -hmm. they were very gentle, a bit humorous, a bit of romance and so on. And um, when I... Uh, wrote my first book for Harper Collins, Am I Guilty? That was really, really out of my comfort zone. But I had this, mm. I'd had this urge for ages to write a darker psychological thriller. So I suppose, in a way, I've already done that. And now I'm yeah. kind of just getting into my stride with the psychological thriller thing with my second one, The Perfect Couple. So um, I have done that. I do have this vague yeah. urge to, because I'm a runner and I'm a, a really keen runner, and um, I do quite long distance stuff. I was training for a 50k ultra marathon when ah. this all happened. <laughs> So that, that was cancelled. <laughs> I know Kelly's the star. So. Um, I found I, was, I find a five k hard enough, and I'm like fifty k. So that's what I was meant. I was meant to be doing that in March, but that all fell through. And I kind of have this vague idea of doing. I've always wanted to run coast to coast, the Britain coast to coast, which is um, about 190 something miles, I think. And I've got this vague idea to do a challenge like that, but then sort of set a book around it somehow and maybe have a murder happen on the way or some something yeah. like that but I would, I, would ha I would have to do the challenge first to, to do the research so that would definitely be slightly out of my comfort zone but um there's a, yeah, there's a book there's wow. a book called the end of the world running club have you oh, heard of that no I think it's I've not read it I think it's dystopian and it's something to do with running but yeah thank you Amazing, really cool. Um, I've got um, another question here, which I'll bring up um, from Catherine, which is how long did it take either of you to find an agent? That's a, that's a good question Ooh. for anyone out there looking. Callie? Um, Callie, would you like to go first? <laughs> um, I was quite lucky. Um, uh, so I approached a, um, agents in the kind of old fashioned way of uh, buying a copy of the Writers and Artists yearbook and looking for ones that represented my genre. Um, and then I had a look at their sort of best-selling authors at the bottom and I picked out the six agents who had the biggest names. I mean, at the time I was writing rom-coms. So I was looking at agents that represented um, Carol Matthews and, and Millie Johnson and people like that. And, um, and I chose six because I'd been told that you should do it in small tranches so that if you got any kind of feedback from those sort of six, you could then work on your submission and then resend it out, um, which I think is which is good advice. Um, and I had five rejections out of the six. And then the sixth one was um, Darley Anderson. And he contacted me and said, um, can he read the whole book, the, the, the 
and, and read it exclusively. So I wasn't allowed to send it to anybody else. And I was like, yeah, yeah, amazing. My God, he wants to read the whole thing. So he went off and he read it. <clears throat> and um, and then he got back to me about six weeks later um, in a phone call. And he he basically said to me that the the book wasn't good enough to be published. It wouldn't stand out on the tables amongst the competition. And I was a bit like, oh, my God, I can't believe he rang me to say these horrible things. Uh, <laughs> why didn't he just send it in the post? Um, yeah. But then he said, I want you to go away and make this better. He said, um, you've got too many ponderous moments in it where, where the main character is reflecting. Cut a load of those, up the pace, make the funny bits funnier. Um, go and buy a one of the best-selling books in the genre, which was... Um, so I bought Sophie Kinsella's Can You Keep a Secret? And he said, study it and see how she makes it a page turner, how she makes the reader laugh, that sort of thing. So I literally did. I read the book once. Then I went back and I underlined every little bit that made me laugh or made me desperate to turn the page. And I taught myself like the rule of comedy. I didn't know comedy was all about things in threes and stuff like that. But by studying her book, I taught myself those things. So I went away. I changed my book, um, made it better resubmitted it heard nothing for absolutely ages I think it was about uh two months and I was just getting ready to send it out to more agents when I had a phone call from Madeline Milburn who was then his head of foreign rights she's now her own agency and, I, and I'm still represented by her today and she said to me that Dali had given her my book to read on a train journey to Scotland and she'd fallen in love with it and she'd love to represent me so I was her first author and um yeah I, that was back in 2007 and we've been together ever since Aww. so I was quite lucky that it was my sixth sixth agent that I approached yeah wow that's a really good story though um how about you Becky um I'm I, I'm actually on my second agent now because I am um, so the first time I started looking for an agent was with my cozy crime series that I mentioned and um that was really really hard I think I probably approached more than 20 agents and didn't get anything and then I started mm. approaching smaller publishers um, who did take unsub un unagented submissions and um, I actually got offered um, a, a deal by a small publisher and then I approached a few more agents and said look I've already got a book deal can you please represent me um, and finally one yeah. did um, so that was fine and I, and I got a deal with it with a, with a small publisher and had this agent for a while but when I decided to change genre and start writing psychological thrillers I thought I'm going to just completely start again as if I'm a debut author and um, yeah. so I decided to try and get a uh, move agents um, and find one that was more suited mm. for psychological thrillers um, and actually the second time around it was much easier partly maybe because it was just a better book or whatever but I did what Callie did. I wrote to about six or seven agents and then I waited and I had, I had a reasonable amount of interest straight away um, and ended up signing with the fabulous Claire Holton, who's actually now shortlisted for Literary Agent of the Year, um, which um, we're all very excited about. She's amazing. So the second time round, it wasn't as difficult, but the first time round, it was it was really difficult. So I think it's one of those things. Persistence is key, though, and also yeah. taking the advice. You know, the, the first time round, when agents were rejecting me, they were all sort of saying similar things. And I realised that my books... Um, the series that I'd written it just needed to be better and I went away and I made it better so I think the whole process from starting to write my first book to getting an agent and a book deal took six years the first time around and the second time around it only took a few months to get an agent so it was or less actually it took a matter of weeks so I think if you're persistent you just have to and take their advice as well and make changes that they suggest as, as Callie did and that's what makes the difference yeah, yeah. I I completely agree with Jackie. Persistence is a huge part of this industry. Um, and mm. the difference between writers who are published and writers who aren't is that writers who are published just kept trying. I know so many authors that, that I mean, I was really lucky to get my first book published, but I, I know authors who had to write six books, mm. you know, and just keep submitting and keep submitting. And it's hard because rejection stings and you doubt yourself and you wonder maybe it's just me. But actually, I, I really think that it's the story. Often you might have written a brilliant book, but somebody else has just got in there with something very similar, you know, a few months before. So you won't get your agent. So mm -hmm. just keep writing and when you write that story that makes an agent sort of excited that's that's when you get your breakthrough you just got to keep trying
It was very interesting. Yeah. I don't know if you saw this during the week. I can't remember who wrote it, but there was a very interesting article that was all over social media about authors and saying that um, 80% of authors give up within three books and only 10% of authors make it to writing six books, I think, which is very mm. interesting. Yeah. And, and that just shows you the power of persistence and not giving up. Yeah, yeah. just need to not mm. give up. Yeah, persistence and, I guess, patience as well, isn't it, to, yeah. to keep keep going have that courage amazing well, we're very happy that you both kept going and look where you are now. So, <laughs> amazing um uh, i've got a question here for both of you that um will bring us back to um both the strangers and the perfect couple in both these books there are multiple points of view um from different characters uh what was kind of your intention in telling the stories in this way i'd love to hear a bit more about that um shall kelly first Okay, um, so <clears throat> yeah, the, the multiple points of view thing is something that I've only really done in the last three books. In my earlier books, I just had one point of view, but sometimes I'd have a past thread. Um, and then mm. when I wrote The Escape, I wrote the point of view of my main character, Joe and her husband's point of view as well. And I actually realised that I really enjoyed the Kind of flip-flopping between the two like from a writing point of view and then when I wrote the fear I wrote the point of view of Lou my main character but also the point of view of Wendy and Chloe and again I just liked in in all the stories um of of that kind of type the characters stories intersect at some point um, and I just found it a really interesting thing to write about, you know, and, and with strangers, it's three lonely people whose lives intersect because of a crime. So you almost have to follow, you know, we start with the aftermath of the crime with the three of them standing around a dead body. We don't know whose body it is or what happened. And then we flip back um, a week earlier and we follow all of their lives separately. So it only would have made sense to write using three points of view. There's no one main character in Strangers. They equally share the story. Um, so that was that was the reason behind doing that for Strangers. Wow, really cool. Um, how, about, how about you, Jackie? Yeah, the perfect couple is told from uh, Gemma. So it's Gemma and Danny are the, the perfect couple and Danny has uh, yeah. dis disappeared. So mine's told it flip-flops between Gemma, the, the wife who's left behind, and the police investigation, which is going on. And I, I just thought, I just, I didn't really intend to do that, actually. And uh, it sort of developed uh, as I wrote the book. And then I thought, no, actually, this is the way to do it. Because Gemma is a slightly unreliable narrator. And so you're not quite sure if her take on everything is true and real. Um, and the police yeah. investigation and her sometimes they're really at odds so I just thought it was quite an interesting way to let the story unfold we see her reacting to certain things we see them discovering things we see her reacting to things they discover um and I just I quite like that idea Gemma's written first person so we're inside her head and the police side is written yeah. third person so again you're inside the head of someone who's going through this bizarre situation where her husband's gone missing is she responsible is she not responsible what's going on and then there's the police who are sort of slightly the more the voice of reason so it gives two completely yeah. different sides to the same story which i thought was quite an interesting way of doing it how hard yeah, did you find, sorry how hard did you find it to write the police procedural thread because that's something that i've always avoided in my books because i think oh my god the amount of research well, Did actually, you... again, it's my it's my laziness, Kelly, because I um because I was a news reporter. Although I work for a shopping channel now as a presenter, I was a news reporter for twenty years. Um, so I worked for um I always worked as a news reporter and I covered hundreds of of high profile uh, crime stories and murders. So the police procedural side is actually not too difficult for me because I've I've mm -hmm. sat in many many court cases and covered many many crimes and you know I I've done lots of um big big crime stories that I won't go into but you will have heard of lots of lots of high profile murders so I sort of know how the police work and what they do um, and I know how it works I have I have been out of news for seven years now so I forget a bit and I obviously things change so I do have a very lovely um I think you know him as well Stuart Gibbon Callie who yes I used him <laughs> he's brilliant he's a he's a retired police detective who um helps out writers like us and, and um if you've got anything if there's anything Great. I can't quite remember how to do or you know what would they do here I'll just run it past him and he's really helpful but generally, yeah. for me, the police procedural side is just from memory of, of years of being a news reporter. So that's quite handy. 
Yeah, very well. That's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've kind of this is a sort of extension of the question to everyone out, um, all the readers out there. We'd love to know your your thoughts um, on that. Like, how did the multiple points of view affect your readings um, of both or either book as you were reading them? Um, because I that's why I asked the question because I think it was what I always find really interesting as a reader from. Uh, reading these multiple points of view is that keeps you guessing throughout obviously um, and I think it's just for me reading both your books you kind of were trying to figure out yeah figure out how they sort of all intersected um, which I think is just a really great way but it just might I don't know it seems like writing multiple points of view can be also do you think more difficult than writing just from one person's perspective um, that's kind of what struck me yeah, I'm actually interesting. I've never written um, a point of view of a man, and you do that really well, Callie. You seem to get in, in your book, The Security yeah. Guards, you know, you really got into the head of a man. I, I think I'd find that quite difficult. I don't know. I've never tried. Yeah. Is that hard to do that? Um, mm. No, I, I, I didn't find it hard particularly, but I, I am very aware that if I'm writing a, a different gender, <clears throat> that I can't get it wrong. Mm. You know, I don't want men yeah male readers to be writing into me and saying oh my god you you, <laughs> you got that man so wrong um <laughs> so i just have to kind of think about men that i know and how they not one particular man but the men that i know how they might react to a a certain situation i did i did like the fact that i made um gareth a bit of a comfort eater mm. um which men do as yeah. as much as women um and his his interactions with his mum i i just wanted to get the right side of tender but not too tender or too nurturing um yeah. gareth's mum's got dementia and and he lives with her so he's he's sort of her carer but yeah, it's it's a constant sort of balance of thinking, would an actual man do that? But even with other characters, like the book that I'm working on now, last night I I had a, a an idea of how a character was going to react to a certain situation. And when I sat back and thought about it, I thought, no, readers are going to be shouting at, at the book. You wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. You would and, and that's the same for any character I write. I think, is this a logical you know a, lo a logical way of reacting to something or a logical way of acting and uh, mm -hmm. if it's not I, I try and take it out and make it more realistic yeah cool um well i've just got a question so i'll we'll do a last couple of questions um now because so i think we've been chatting for a while though it's great we keep chatting for ages um <laughs> but here, yeah, which is um, from Rosie, do you read reviews? Which I think is a really important oh. question. I know it's quite hard to do sometimes, <laughs> right? Uh, it's funny, um, when I first started writing, um, reviews used to just kill me. I mean, they used to absolutely kill me. I, I, mm. The good ones are amazing and it's great to get good ones, but it's the bad ones that always stay in your head. And it's the bad, and, and generally most books have more good reviews than bad reviews, but it's the bad ones that you remember. And so for a while I had to give up reading uh, reviews. And um, mm. But now I'm kind of, I think you get used to it as well. Now I'm kind of okay with it. And in fact, some of the bad ones I actually find really funny. Um, I think they're quite entertaining to read and um, mm. so the good ones are always great but I, I do there was two two when my book first went on NetGalley which is um, for people who don't know it's where books go before they come out so that early bloggers and reviewers can can look at them there's two hilarious reviews for the perfect couple one of both of which weirdly involved fire one of them said that um, she quite liked the plot but the characters were so dim they wouldn't notice if their own heads were on the fire which I thought was brilliant <laughs> And the second one, and the second one said she hated the book so much she wanted to throw her Kindle out of the window and set it on fire for good measure. <laughs> and oh I just, my I really god! Like, I've got to the point now where I actually think, yeah. okay, that's funny because I don't like every book I've ever read, you know. And yeah. I, I, people are completely entitled to not like your books, and you just have to try not to take it personally. And um, so mm. I do read reviews. Is the short answer now, and I try not to let the bad ones bother me, but it's still always nice to get good ones. Yeah, yeah. I, I will. I will have a look, um, particularly I, I will look on NetGalley just to get to get a sense of that initial reaction. I won't necessarily read every single one, <clears throat> but I'll kind of sort of skim through to see if there's an overall sort of feeling about the book. 
And that can be quite reassuring. Um, obviously, you live in fear that you're going to bring a book out and you're going to get like a two out of five average oh. or something. Everybody hates it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that that would be awful. The odd, the odd, the odd bad review is absolutely fine. I was much more sensitive to them at the beginning of my career. When my first book, my rom com, came out, the first review I ever found on the internet was a horrible one, and oh. I cried. Oh. I thought everyone was going to hate it. But now, you know, if if I did have a book come out and it had a really low average on Amazon or Waterstones or wherever, that that would hurt if everybody across the board didn't like it. Um, but I think, you know, as long as my books get an average of four and above, I feel like um, that, that I've, I've done a pretty good job. So that's fine. But um, one thing I have noticed, and Jackie, you will probably discover this um, as your book is in the top 10 of Amazon, is that the better your book sells, the more likely you are to get really horrible reviews as a result. So, yeah. and, and I've seen it happen to countless authors going, oh my God, I'm getting so many one star reviews. That's like, it's because you're in the top 10 and um, people yeah. wouldn't normally buy your book are now buying your book. So because because Strangers is also in the top 10, I am now bracing myself for an onslaught of people who uh, hate it. See, so, I've, I've, never, <laughs> I've never been in the top 10 before, so I didn't really, yes, that, that's logical though. Yes, I'll brace myself yeah. as well then. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta own it, you know. You do. Yeah. You guys are smashing it, so that's the main <laughs> thing. Um, so, my final question for you both, um, which I think will be a good one to end on, is: Why do you think we're so drawn to psychological thrillers as readers? Oh, that's the as our means of the psychological thriller. <laughs> it's sort of the. It, I don't know. I think most of us try to live our lives in a sort of as happy and positive a way as we can. But there's always that intrigue about the darker side of life, isn't there? And, and I think that's why, you know, crime dramas on TV are always massively successful. And I think there's something about exploring that darker side of ourselves that's quite fascinating. And I've mm. always I've always found it really interesting. It's that sort of big question like, why do some why do why do most people not go around murdering? but just some do, you know, it's that yeah. really interesting facet of our personalities and, and human nature. And I just think it's endlessly intriguing. And I think that's why, although there's often these, you know, warnings, oh, psychological thrillers have had their day, nobody wants them anymore, but we kind of do. And they still sell really well. And I still mostly yeah. read, read crime and psychological thriller. So I think it's just human nature, isn't it? We're fascinated by that darker side of life, maybe. Mm. Mm. I think I think the big draw as well with psychological thrillers is the whole sort of problem solving, mystery solving. Um, and mm. also because the main characters are often normal people like us, we can put ourselves in their shoes and think, you know, mm -hmm. what would I do? Well, like because I'm I'm listening to the audiobook of Jackie's book at the moment, and you know, I, I am sort of in the head of this woman mm -hmm. whose whose husband has gone missing, and I'm also seeing it from the point of view of the police. And I'm I'm trying to solve the mystery before they do. So as I'm reading, I'm, yeah. I'm guessing. I, I'm, I'm not going to say my theories in case anybody else is reading it. But I'm thinking, could it be this? Could this have happened? Could this have happened? Because there's, mm. there's a real sense of satisfaction as a reader. If you guess it, then you're like, yeah, you know. But if you don't guess it and, and the author outsmarts you or throws in a twist you didn't see then that's a, a pleasurable sensation as well because you're like you know I didn't see that coming and um and I, I think that's why that people enjoy them so much because yeah. it's a guessing game and and they're pacey um and you know a good one you you can get through in a, in a couple of days um mm -hmm. so hopefully people will continue to enjoy them yeah, definitely. I think I think they just see, like you're saying, it, they sort of seem to release endorphins as well. I think probably because you're like you're trying to. It is a game in that sense, and you're inside people's heads trying to figure it out. And you know, who doesn't love a good game? So, yeah. <laughs> unless it's Monopoly played umpteen times with my son. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <it's> <laughs> Is in Monopoly, isn't there? There always is. Mm -hmm. I find anyway. <laughs> um, cool. Well, I think that's you know all we have time for today, ladies. But thank you so much for joining me. That was so great to chat to you. It's just amazing to see how well, like, 
how amazing you both are. So thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it was a pleasure. Um, thank you for inviting me. It was lovely. Yeah, thank you. Oh, it was lovely. Thank you. Um, so everyone, I'll just say goodbye to Jackie and Callie, um, and then I'll say goodbye to you all. But um, goodbye to you both for now. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you for watching, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Amazing. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. Um, I thought it was just brilliant to hear from two such incredible authors and get all their, you know, fascinating insights. Um, now I'll just quickly tell you about our next book club, which is going to be um, next Monday on the um, 18th of May. Oh, I'll just disappear away this question. Um, on the 18th of May, and I'll be joined by Abigail Mann, author of The Lonely Fajita, um, which is actually out tomorrow. So if you're searching for a hilarious feel-good read this is definitely the one and will put a big smile on your face I can't recommend it enough so grab it when it's out tomorrow and I can't wait to see you all again on Monday but in the meantime I hope you have a lovely rest of your week stay safe and speak soon thank you bye